if your patient's wrist looks like this, or their x-ray looks like this, you have a distal radius fracture to take care of. Dr. Christina Ward has helped me care for a lot of broken bones, and she will show you the best way to manage this common fracture. This video doesn't touch on ultrasound, but remember that ultrasound is a great way to diagnose and help care for distal radius fractures. Click here for my distal radius fracture ultrasound video. And now, Dr. Ward. Purpose. <laughs> I have the most important job for you, okay? If you screw this up, it is going to really screw things up and just really like, okay, these are the important things, you know. And so I was going to talk a little bit about doing hematoma blocks for distal radius fractures. And, uh, you know, that's by far the most common way we're going to anesthetize a patient for doing a reduction. And so uh, when you do a hematoma block, what you want to do is actually have your needle enter the fracture site and instill the anesthetic in there. And a couple common mistakes that I see or things that make it more difficult is if people use a really small needle, like a 25 gauge, they can't tell that they're in the fracture. Like you can't, you don't drop in the way you can with a bigger needle. So I usually use a 20 gauge. I mean, you can use bigger, an 18 gauge. And I use a mixture of lidocaine and marcaine. There's really no need to use epi. You're not looking for any hemostasis. And there's not really any evidence that for hematoma blocks that that lasts significantly longer, as opposed to when you're doing like a sub Q block where it does. Um, and the most common error I see is that people feel the joint and think that's the fracture and they try and put their needles straight in like this. And you can see because the distal radius fracture is almost always dorsally angulated that if you try and enter straight into the fracture, you'll almost never get in. And you end up poking around and sometimes giving up and just instilling some local there. So what, what I recommend is sort of feeling where you think the fracture actually is and then force yourself to go about a centimeter proximal to that to enter the skin. And then if you enter the skin, you'll go right down onto the bone and you'll feel bone, 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 whoops, and then you're in the fracture site. And you should really be able to aspirate, even if it's 24 hours old, 48 hours old, you still should be able to get a little flash of blood in your needle. And then you don't need like eight million cc's. I usually use about eight cc's total. Um, every once in a blue moon, I'll have a patient who has a hematoma block and they get some FPL paralysis after that, probably from somehow numbing up the FPL. But generally speaking, if they have a neuro deficit after you've done a hematoma block, you need to look for another cause because it really shouldn't be from the hematoma block. All right, so let's say um, we've done our hematoma block. Oh, and I'll give you one other tip for a hematoma block. We don't have a mayo stand, but I'm just going to steal this tool. The other thing about doing a hematoma block is if you put yourself in a good position, which I'm going to fail to do because I'm using a stool, but if you put yourself in a good position, it's a lot easier. So if you get a mayo stand next to the gurney for the patient and you have them just rest their wrist like this, like put a couple of towels on the mayo stand and rest their wrist over the edge of the mayo stand, one thing you're doing is you're already starting to get a little bit of a reduction by having them flex down here. And the other thing you're doing is making it easy to get in. It's a lot harder to do your hematoma block when they're hanging in finger traps like this or if you have somebody holding them. So if you just rest it over the edge, you're really kind of setting yourself up to win. This is actually also, if you have an elderly patient who has bad bone, I don't put them in finger traps. I just put them over the edge of a mayo stand and let their hand hang down and then gentle pressure here because if you overdo it with the elderly patient the two problems you get are skin tears and almost everybody will do that once during their career and then it'll look so awful they'll never want to have it happen again um, and the other problem you can get is over reduction so you turn a dorsally angulated fracture into a volarly angulated fracture which from a fracture stability and healing standpoint is a much worse problem so it's better to underdo it with elderly patients than overdo it. And I find too that elderly patients with arthritic fingers really don't tolerate finger traps real well. So this is another sort of nice thing for them. So just a couple of towels, let it rest like this. And then with the elderly patient, I think of it more as like milking than doing the classic reduction maneuver we think about where we're like over the top, nothing like that. It's all mushy bone in there. You're just gonna milk it down like this milk it down like that. So 
It's a tip for elderly patients and hematoma blocks. The last thing about hematoma block, though, that I should mention you really need to wait after you do a hematoma block. So uh, it takes about 15 minutes or so for them to really feel some relief. And, you know, the desire is to, like, slam it in, get them in the finger traps, leave the room, come back. It's really better to put it in, get all your other stuff set up, then put them in finger traps. Because if you put them in finger traps before their pain has been relieved, then it totally subverts the goal of finger traps. Because with finger traps, what you're really trying to do is fatigue their muscles so that they're not resisting you. And if they're hurting when you put them in finger traps, it just does the opposite, right? They're just like, oh. So, wait. It's so hard. I remember as a resident, I would be like, with everything, slam in some local and get started. And the patient would be like, what? I put in tons of local. How are you hurting? So let's talk about finger traps and reduction. You kind of want to, you know, use an appropriate amount of weight. So if you have a thin, small person, you don't need 20 pounds. 10 pounds is probably good. If you have a really big BC guy, then you might need a little bit more. And basically, can you scoot over a little bit? You want them, yep, comfortably on the bed so that their shoulder is supported. That, that's good. You don't want their shoulder off the edge of the bed, just because mostly because it's uncomfortable. And then you're going to put them in finger traps here. You can use whichever fingers you want. I use the index and ring fingers. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more why I picked that in a minute. It'll come more clear. So you're going to put the patient in finger traps, and then you're going to hang weight over their forearm. And so I actually usually use some stockinette to hang my weights. I just hang it over the arm like this, and I've got a little hole in it. And then we won't put 400 pounds on. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so then when you do that, you don't have a real narrow point right here oh, no. with a lot of weight on it. And just because there's no reason to have you tormented, I'm taking, <laughs> we won't keep that on. But so you hang weight, and then I usually wait about 15 minutes or so. That's usually long enough for it to fatigue. The patient should not be having a lot of pain at this point. So if they are, something's going on. Either your hematoma block isn't good, or maybe there's someone who's just super anxious and they need something else. But just doing this with five or 10 pounds shouldn't be super painful for patients. So now if you have a young person who's got good muscle and good bone, and they, especially if they have an extra articular fracture, I'm gonna move these out of the way, then, um, then you do probably wanna do more of like a classic reduction maneuver meaning that you're going to hyperextend the wrist and then bring it back over the top. And so what I try and do is feel with my thumb where I feel like the fracture is and put my thumb on that distal fracture fragment, bring it back and then up over the top and you really have to hyperflex it. So sometimes people get nervous, like they kind of stop right here, but use all of those ligaments and periosteum that's attached here to help you out and flex it all the way down like this. You know, I do it, like I said, where I'm pushing here. Elderly person skin, you have to be really cautious with that. The other technique that's described that also works well is feeling the lunate, because usually the fracture will move with the lunate, and trying to do the same thing, pushing on the lunate instead of the fracture fragment. And maybe if you have a lot of comminution back here, that's a better option. Um, I think it's kind of, you know, whatever works for you, dealer's choice. So then you have your reduction, and the next part is getting your splint on. I, I take the weights off when I do okay. a reduction. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then I take the weights off, I take the finger traps off when I'm doing a splint too, because the with the finger traps on, it kind of puts the wrist in a little bit of extension. Mm -hmm. um, and so as, even though it seems like a really minor thing, how the fingers are held while you're putting on your splint kind of makes a difference. So the classic problem that I see is the patient who has what we call fingers in a pickle jar. So somebody said, hey Tom, can you hold these fingers for me while I put on this splint? Mm -hmm. And Tom grabs them like the, I mean, not Tom in this case, but theoretically Tom could make that small technical error, um, you know, grabbing them like this. And that's really not good. So that's where if you are going to leave them in finger traps or you have someone helping you, having them hold 
the index and the pinky or the index and the ring finger really keeps you from getting that fingers in a pickle jar. And patients hate it and it's really bad for finger motion. So it's a minor thing, but it makes a big difference. So I'm gonna have you hold like this for now. Um, So then I don't use stockinette. It's again, not a right or wrong thing, but I just like to be able to see the patient's skin. And I'm gonna start putting soft roll on here at her palm. And the beauty of soft roll is that it tears easily. So you have like the world's easiest arm. We're gonna keep it elbow at 90 degrees cause it's not really conical. But if you had someone who had a much bigger arm up here, you just keep this end of the soft roll touching the skin and pull this end away so it tears so that it lays flat. And you can see how flat that lays. And you really want it to be, I mean, I, I shoot for kind of having it double, or like overlapping by 50% each, each round. Um, you know, and people also have different philosophies about how much soft roll you need, where I trained we did not much soft roll. You want a few extra layers up here where the end of your splint is going to be so that they don't get a pressure point there. And you can see that in the antecubital fossa, I've left it open. And the reason for that is as the patient swells, this can become a really tight band and that can lead you to having compartment syndrome. Or if not compartment syndrome, just swelling, discomfort, nerve symptoms. So since you do that, you can see this is pretty bare back here. So how are we going to make that work well it's the beauty of the soft roll that tears is i can just put a few layers back here that aren't going to be at all constrictive volarly but still provide adequate padding down there and then just because people get alarmed if they see skin i do that to cover it up so no one looks at it so then down here in the palm is the other area where you can see here if you look here that i definitely need some more padding and um I, sometimes people are taught to extend their padding way past where they think their splint is going to end. I find when people do that, they forget where their splint was supposed to end and then their splint ends up too long. That's a real problem here in the hand because if patients don't have MP motion, those fingers get stiff and especially for because distal radius fractures are so common among middle-aged women who also have some hand arthritis, they are really likely to get stiff if your splint's too long. So I stop my soft roll right at the distal palmar crease. And I put a little bit extra around the thumb web space because that tends to be a spot where it rubs. So I think we're in pretty good shape. So I start by measuring out how big I need it to be. And I make it a little bit longer because your plaster will shrink mm. when you get it warm and, uh, and wet. And I usually use, for women, I'll use eight thicknesses. If you have a really burly guy, then you can do a little bit more, but especially elderly women do not care for big, heavy splints. You know, and you were asking me just about plaster or not. I prefer plaster because it molds better, and also it's a little easier to fold if you have a little bit too much. Um, it's just a bit more malleable in that regard than fiberglass. Fiberglass has a lot of memory, and so even though you try and shape it a certain way, it tends to kind of bounce back. And if you have a sharp fiberglass edge, then it really um, cuts in and bothers the patient. So I take the end that's gonna be in the palm, and I cut it at an angle. Because if you look at somebody's distal palmar crease, it's an angle, and you can kind of cut away for the thumb too, like that. So that will fit nicely in somebody's crease, and then they can get full MP motion. Whereas if you leave it straight across, so if we look at the other side of this, it's all going to fall apart when I do this. If you leave it straight across and put it at the right distance, you see how that blocks MP motion of the small finger. So it's just a little thing again, but again, for finger motion, it doesn't take a lot to cause problems, especially if people have a little bit of arthritis. So you're going to get your plaster wet, and you actually want it really wet. So this water's cold, which will be fine for it not setting up. How do you um, pick a temperature? 
I like it warm because I'm usually working fast, but when you're learning, cold is better because you have more time to get it done. Um, but you actually need to kind of, like you see how there's these little holes. You actually have to kind of rub the plaster together to get the plaster to knit together. So if you put it in cold water and you don't rub it together, it'll kind of fall apart as you're trying to work with it. It won't act like one big sheet. So you want it dripping wet like that. We have our cut edge down here. So you put the cut edge in the palm and then bring it around the elbow and up the back side. And this length here is actually pretty good. You remember I said I cut it a little bit longer because it shrinks when you use it. But if you have extra length, instead of balling it up in the palm where it blocks finger motion, you fold it over the back here. And then they're not fighting it when they're trying to move. So now is when I would ask my assistant to change positions. So instead of holding here, and actually you can do this earlier, but I'm gonna have him hold like this in the palm, like that. So. Yep. And what you'll notice is as you relax here, when you hold it there, if you just let it hang, let your arm really hang, you'll see that it actually brings the wrist into a little bit of flexion. So like maybe without the splint on, you'll be able to see better actually. So if I hold him here by his fingers, his wrist is kind of in neutral. Really let your arm hang. I swear I won't drop you. Okay. And then if I hold him in here without trying to do anything, it puts it in a little bit of flexion. And if you think about, you know, what is better or worse for your reduction, having a little bit of flexion is obviously better. What's bad is a lot of flexion. So you really can't have more than about 20 degrees or people will get acute carpal tunnel syndrome. So you don't have to do this, but you can cover your um, plaster with some soft roll. And the nice thing about that is then if it gets too tight and someone needs to release it later, then they don't have to cut off. Yeah, they don't have to trash the whole So the last thing I'll point out about this splint is when you're putting it around the thumb, don't just cut a hole in the ACE wrap. You wanna have a slit like this because as the patient's thumb swells, which inevitably will happen, it can get really constrictive there and I've seen it cause a little bit of skin necrosis in the web space. So then that goes right in here. And now if her thumb swells, there's nothing holding this proximally. So this can actually shift a little bit and leave room for the thumb. So I start there, some people don't start at that spot, but I think it's easier to just start with that slit and then you have it right where you want. Your ace wrap, you're, you're just laying it on, or if you put it on really snug because you want it to help mold your splint, then you need to come back and loosen it later. That's probably a bad practice, but what I used to do in residency before volar plates where your clothes reduction was really your best shot, is we would put the sugar tongue on as tight as we could but it's not really a good practice because obviously you don't want to put on tight splints and what if somebody gets sent out and you haven't, you know, cut that, <laughs> loosened it, yeah. So that's it. And now if we look at her sugar tongue, we can see her thumbs pointing at her shoulder so she's in a nice neutral position. And if we ask her to make a fist, she's got good motion all the way down to her MP. And give me a thumbs up and bend it down and straighten out your fingers and look at that. No fingers in a pickle jar and yet it's still providing good support right up to the edge, right where we want it there, and right where we want it in the back. There you go. Um, you know, like you might say, well, for sure this patient is gonna need surgery, why am I even bothering to do the reduction? But the number one reason why you're doing the reduction is to take the tension off the median nerve and the finger flexors. And the number two reason is to uh, improve their finger motion. So there's a couple easy finger motion exercises that we teach the patients in clinic, and so, they're really easy to remember actually. So you start with your fingers straight and then you bend at the MPs and you keep the PIP straight. And we call this tabletop. And then you bend at the PIPs and the DIPs and straighten your MPs. That's claw. And then you do fist. The common error is that people will accidentally put it on in pronation or supination, which generally is not as good as neutral. And the way to avoid that is that when you have, when you, they're putting the splint on, so the way to avoid that is to make sure that you're getting their shoulder at 90 when you're working because like it starts to drift like this, drift like this, drift like this and the tendency is for the hand to either supinate or pronate as they're doing that or maybe you go up here too far. But if you keep them right at 90 then it's a lot easier to go, oh yeah, 